So, we've talked a lot about high blood pressure, what it is, how it happens, why it's bad, and the pharmaceutical agents doctors use to treat it. We're going to talk about the impact of lifestyle factors, particularly diet and exercise, and most particularly strength training. Hi, I'm Jonathan Sullivan, and welcome back to Graysteel. Whether or not you require medication for your blood pressure, you're not getting optimal therapy until you dial in your lifestyle factors. Sleep, stress reduction, diet, exercise. We're going to look at diet and exercise in this video because they have such a profound effect. Let's look at diet first. Weight loss is one of the principal lifestyle interventions in the management of high blood pressure. And so, obviously, a massive caloric surplus, especially in the setting of a sedentary lifestyle, is going to be problematic. So, the first issue is total energy intake. If you have high blood pressure and you're overweight, this, and this, and this, just aren't going to be a regular part of your life anymore. The party's over. Portion control and moderating your caloric intake to decrease body fat are going to be critical. It's a future of lean meats, fruits, and vegetables for you. And that's really not so bad. In fact, it's kind of great. Trust me, you'll learn to love it. And don't feel guilty. These guys have plenty of other victims. They'll be just fine without your business. More's the pity. Excessive alcohol intake is bad for you in a lot of ways. And yeah, it can increase your blood pressure over time through a variety of mechanisms, including its contribution to obesity. So go easy. The two gorillas in the room are sodium and potassium. Now, Sodium has been a bit demonized in the popular press, and there's been a lot of hyperbole and hysteria about it. It's important to remember that sodium is critical for normal cellular and physiological functioning. Your brain and your muscles, to use just two examples, run on sodium currents. On the other hand, there's no shortage of sodium in the North American diet, and most of us consume far, far more than the minimum daily requirement there is evidence that significant reductions in sodium intake will do most of us some good. And for people with salt-sensitive hypertension, sodium intake is a very big deal indeed. So, go a little easy with the salt shaker and consider other seasonings to liven up your food. Potassium is another critical electrolyte for proper cellular functioning, particularly in excitable tissues like those in the brain, heart, and skeletal muscles. Increasing potassium intake may have a beneficial effect on blood pressure, although the data on this is a little bit mixed. Unlike sodium, potassium may be underconsumed by many people in North America, primarily because fruits and vegetables are underconsumed by many people in North America. For those without salt-sensitive hypertension or heart failure, we can nicely address both of these electrolytes by increasing the use of potassium in our diet. You can try potassium chloride, the most common salt substitute, which replaces the sodium in table salt with potassium. Or you can buy mixed products, which contain both salts and are better tolerated by those with discriminating palates. Either way, you'll be doing yourself a huge favor in increasing your potassium intake. And don't worry about your sodium. You'll still get plenty of that in your diet, trust me. And let's not gloss over the fruits and vegetables. Plant-based foods are low in sodium, high in potassium, rich in nutritious vitamins and minerals, and low in overall caloric density. For these and other reasons, it makes sense that data suggests that vegetarian and vegan diets are associated with lower blood pressure, not to mention lower rates of obesity and heart disease. I am not a proponent of vegetarianism or veganism, but I'm not really an opponent either. Dietary choices involve a lot more than just science and health, including aesthetics, culture, ethics, religion, even politics. And I am staying all the hell away from that stuff. But you don't have to be a strict herbivore to appreciate the importance of incorporating lots of plant-based foods into your diet. Most dietary recommendations for hypertension and heart disease incorporate limiting meat intake. 
This is because of the putative relationship between saturated fat intake and the risk of cardiometabolic diseases like coronary artery disease and diabetes. High fat meats are consumed by Americans in great abundance and frankly in excess. Recommendations to limit meat are aimed at limiting saturated fat intake and the corresponding total caloric intake. This is not because saturated fat is toxic in and of itself. Any more than carbohydrate or protein or a glass of beer or wine is toxic. It's the excess of saturated fat in the North American diet and the corresponding excess in total food energy that is the issue, not the nutrient itself. Moderation is a beautiful thing. The DASH diet, or Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, is a well-studied nutritional pattern recommended by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health. The Institute studied a variety of non-vegetarian plans and investigated the results. The ultimately recommended DASH diet included lean meat, fish, and poultry, and was especially rich in fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes, and low in sweets. The DASH diet reduced systolic blood pressure by 6 millimeters of mercury and diastolic blood pressure by 3 millimeters of mercury in patients with elevated blood pressure, what we used to call pre-hypertension. Patients with hypertension saw a drop of 11 systolic and 6 diastolic, even without weight loss. When the DASH diet was combined with lower sodium intake in the DASH N diet, N for sodium, the results seemed even more effective. The DASH diet can accommodate any level of total caloric requirement, so even heavy training athletes can use it, although they'll probably have to supplement their protein intake over DASH recommendations. We're just scratching the surface here, so I've included links to some readings, including an overview of the DASH diet down in the doobly-doo. After the initial studies, some follow-up research has shown disappointingly modest results, and it has been suggested that it's time for a critical reappraisal of the DASH diet, that the search for an optimum dietary approach to hypertension has just begun. You'll find stuff on that in the doobly-doo, too. Still in all, if your eating is out of control and you have high blood pressure and you just don't know what to do, a change in your nutritional strategy along the lines of the DASH diet certainly won't hurt you, and there's a good chance it'll help. When it comes to exercise and high blood pressure, the news is pretty much all good. A large body of data shows that exercise, in general, promotes decreases in blood pressure and may decrease the need for antihypertensive medication. Now, if anybody tells you that exercise, or diet, or anything else can cure established chronic hypertension, you really need to give them the hairy eyeball. If any good clinical data to that effect actually exists, I'd really like to see it. Nothing would make me happier, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Exercise is excellent and essential for high blood pressure, but as far as I know, it's not a cure. In 2018, there is no cure for established chronic hypertension. Suggesting otherwise is misguided or worse, not to mention dangerous. Now, of course, there's exercise, and then there's exercise. Specifically, when people talk about exercise, they tend to lump everything together into either aerobic exercise or lifting weights. If they're just knowledgeable enough to be dangerous, they might talk about endurance training versus resistance training. But that's really the same pair of pigeonholes. But not to worry, because whether your focus is aerobic endurance training or strength resistance training, you're doing yourself a huge favor if you have high blood pressure. Now, when you tell people that running or hiking will help their blood pressure, most will go, yep. But when you talk about strength training with weights in people with high blood pressure, there's still a lot of folks, and even some doctors, will look at you funny and say, You really are crazy. But hold the Thorazine. The data says you're not wacko. Strength training also exerts a beneficial effect on high blood pressure. For example, Cornelison et al. conducted a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of the effect of strength training on blood pressure 
published in the journal Hypertension in 2011. 28 studies met inclusion criteria and the analysis encompassed 1,012 subjects. The authors found a significant reduction in blood pressure in prehypertensive patients and a small but statistically insignificant change in those with established hypertension. The authors also found a positive effect on VO2 peak, a marker of aerobic conditioning, and on body fat and triglycerides. Cornelison and colleagues conducted a more expansive analysis published in the Journal of the American Heart Association in 2013. This time, the meta-analysis incorporated 93 trials and more than 5,000 subjects. The authors again found a benefit of all forms of exercise, strength training, endurance training, and isometric hand grip training. A 2017 meta-analysis by D'Souza et al. found significant reductions in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure for strength training, using a strict set of inclusion criteria that incorporated only five studies out of the 1,608 considered for review, encompassing a total of 201 subjects. It's important to note that the research on this topic is hampered by a number of problems small study sizes, significant variations in methodology and study design, and the almost universal use of what I call low-dose exercise medicine. Not enough big multi-joint exercises, very conservative loading schemes, very moderate progression. Even so, the literature indicates that there is a benefit from all forms of exercise, including strength training, and certainly no reason to believe that exercise of any form makes blood pressure worse. You'll hear some people talk about studies showing decreased arterial compliance in people who do strength training. And it's true. Multiple studies show that arterial stiffness increases slightly with strength training. But the key word is slightly. And we're not entirely sure what's going on with this data. My guess is that the very minor decreases in arterial compliance represent an adaptive response that allows blood vessels to better tolerate the spikes in blood pressure that we know occur during heavy lifting. In any event, arterial compliance is not a patient-oriented outcome, and its clinical significance is unclear. There is no good evidence, none, that this mild effect on arterial compliance translates into chronic increases in blood pressure, effects on organ perfusion, or any negative cardiovascular outcome whatsoever. In 2018, the data indicates that the net effect of strength training on cardiovascular health in general, and high blood pressure in particular, is positive. Lots of stuff on this down in the doobly-doo. So, if you have high blood pressure, what's more important? Endurance or strength training? Well, both forms of exercise have benefits. Both are safe and beneficial for your blood pressure. And there is evidence that suggests that the effects are synergistic. In other words, you should do both. As we pointed out at the beginning of this series, hypertension is bad. The negative effects of uncontrolled high blood pressure are profound. But we live in an age when there are treatments available to control your blood pressure and let you live a normal, vigorous, healthy life. And these treatments include medications, but also, and very importantly, lifestyle modifications. So, if you have elevated blood pressure or established hypertension, you need to talk to your doctor, not just about medication, but also about an aggressive lifestyle modification program that addresses stress reduction, healthy sleep, positive changes to your diet, and a rational exercise program that incorporates both strength training and appropriate conditioning. And then, you need to stick with it. We may not have cured hypertension yet, but we know how to keep this monster chained up in its pit. And as with most things pertaining to your health, the guy responsible for keeping it there isn't your doctor. It's you. Thanks for watching this episode of Grace Deal, and thanks to my friends and colleagues who made invaluable suggestions to the script for this episode. Robert Santana, coach and dietitian, Dr. Phil Lewalski, the man with the red shoes, and Dr. Matt Aiken. Thanks a lot, guys. 
Remember, our content is provided for educational and infotainment purposes only and will never be offered as medical advice for any particular person, patient, disease, or condition. When it comes to your health, you should work closely with your physician. Until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.